So tonight, once again, we return to this beautiful book on the path to enlightenment and just so sweet. Last week, we finished up the chapter on being a hermit. And this week, chapter 13, very auspicious 13, is deepening our spiritual practice. And it's, I just find this chapter so inspiring. It's really, it's only a couple pages. And I, I think I'm on to this book. The less pages, like, there's just a real, like, cutting through wisdom like it's so beautiful it's literally offering all the goods in just such a pithy way even before we practice i, I just want to read the first paragraph so to remind folks or introduce folks if they haven't known about this book it's a collection of ancient teachers and teachings but put together by matthew ricard who's a contemporary scholar humanitarian um, and <clears throat> and writer author of many books and he kind of gives his pith instruction at the beginning of each chapter and, and this one especially I feel like is so beautiful and resonant. He says the notion of practice may seem to imply a sense of obligation and certainly involves a commitment to work on oneself with effort and regularity. That is an indispensable condition for a student to progress toward enlightenment. If a beginner does not practice regularly and does not adopt a certain discipline, it will be quite impossible to stabilize the mind and cultivate altruistic love and other essential qualities. The practice involves both turning inward and openness to others. It begins with introspection that makes one aware of the positive and negative aspects of the mind and allows one to encourage the former and correct the latter. I'll read that one passage again. I had to read it like six times. I thought it's a lot in there. The practice involves turning inward and openness to others. So just such a beautiful piece. I know many of you in this room really live by this, but that the practice asks us, asks us to turn inward and to others, not placing one above the other, not one first, but inward and to others. It begins with an introspection that makes one aware of the positive and negative aspects of the mind and allows one to encourage the former and correct the latter. Nothing is wrong here. There's nothing wrong in your mind. There are parts of it that are positive, meaning generating of collaboration and connection, kindness, waking up on the spiritual path and parts of your mind that maybe are negative, that get in the way, that are harmful and delusional. And you make space so that you can encourage those positive qualities and correct the latter. Just love that pith instruction. So we'll dive deeper into this chapter after we do some practice together. So for those of us in the physical space here, just a reminder that there are, I think, cushions some over there. Oh, good move. Cushions over there, blankets, get yourself comfy. If you have a device on you and you wanna silence it, that's super welcome. Does it dim? That's nice. I liked the uh, option one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So let's give ourselves a moment to find a posture that can support us. Feeling that sense of not obligation, but commitment to the practice. 
the wonderful uprightness of our spine, serving as a channel from heaven down to earth. And feeling a sense of ease, relaxation through the entire front of the body. It's always so wonderful to remind ourselves why we practice. Giving ourselves that opportunity to touch into the reality of impermanence and the incredible preciousness of this human life. And reflecting on the reality, which is so easy to see everywhere around us, that what we do, what we think, and what we cultivate has a direct impact on our own lives and the lives of others. And to help us slip deeper into this present moment as we begin our practice, bringing to mind once again something so easy to see all around us. When we invest in introspection <clears throat> of our heart and mind, we cultivate that which is so much greater than the day-to-day -day worries of samsara. There is truly nothing more important than the cultivation of our heart and mind in this moment.
feel or imagine a sense of the past behind us. Already gone. And the future unfolding in front of us. Not yet known. And inviting us to arrive with full presence to this unfolding moment. Breath by breath by breath. An essential part of our practice, a simple foundation of bringing our attention and awareness back to the breath over and over. And whenever we meet with a distraction, whether it's a sensation in the body or a sound, we meet it with gentleness. And we simply relax and release and return to the breath. How subtle can you notice the breath? Following it through its entire course of inhale and exhale. As though a rider following every move of their horse. Simply ride the breath with full attention, curiosity, kindness.
while still maintaining some connection to our breath. We can expand our attention and awareness to any emotional residue, personal material we may have noticed already in the course of this practice. Maybe we have a sense of worry or loss. Some flavor or version of insufficiency, doubt. Without energizing these experiences or thoughts, bring kind awareness to the sensations. Notice how this feels in the body. And feel or imagine as though each breath could slightly touch this area with kindness and ventilate and pierce through. attending to this level in the subtle body can allow us to be more fully here. So imagine that sense of simply peeling away anything between you and the presence of fully being with your next breath. A couple more breaths, kindly, precisely attending to the body. And with your next exhale, extend your awareness in all directions. No longer only in the body. Feel or imagining a sense of spaciousness, openness. Feeling your awareness all around you radiating boundless. And 
in the spaciousness of awareness, sounds come and go. Thoughts come and go. All sensory experiences just arising and passing through. And then shifting back, oscillating our awareness from wide open to once again, noticing the breath in the body, regathering the full force of your attention just here. Notice the very subtle sensations of breath coming and going through the nostrils. With our next breath, once again, continuing this oscillation. Exhale, extend and expand awareness in all directions. Above and below. Side to side. All around. Feel the mind, heart and body mingling with space. And feel or imagine that open expanse of awareness.
He can't hear you. It's already been a while. How about now? Okay. When did it drop? Just curious. I think just ten like minutes. a minute ago. Just 10 minutes? Oh, huh. Your awareness know. practice is strong, Lindsay. Strong, strong. <laughs> okay. Yeah, any, any questions or reflections on that practice? <clears throat> we did a bit of the oscillation there, more closed and more open, landed in our hearts, and then again, more open awareness. I think I see a raised hand. Do you see it? Oh. Yeah, Cindy. Okay. Um, thank you. Yes. Uh, for me, the, um, the, it took a bit of, um, to reopen and to stay open after, you know, going within. Um, but once I did, it was just um, really like a light and um, almost energizing for me. Mm, wonderful. So just wanted to share and say thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, it is interesting, right? That oscillation in and out it can, I think I, I agree with Cindy, I think it kind of energizes or can energize our awareness a bit and <clears throat> help it have that sense of, um, of spaciousness just by contrast of bringing it inward, bringing it outward. In the traditional way I first learned it, you were supposed to do it on one breath. I find that too hard. So inhale, bring it all the way in, exhale all the way out inhale all the way in and i just like hyperventilate um so i i like giving a little more space to have that uh transition yeah other questions thoughts reflections This mic, this mic, yes. Uh, the idea of offering um, the same word to myself as then extending outward really resonated. Mm. And um, for me, it was, uh, I offered myself this kind of like relief through the word, ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. And then when the invitation to extend that out, it was like, oh, I'm like, can I take a sigh of relief on behalf of everyone here? Mm. So that would, that felt like normally with repeating the different phrases, I don't feel that same connection of mm. inward outward. So I think keeping it to one was really mm. skillful. Sweet. Thank, Thank you. you. Were you all able to hear? Okay, I will, I gave us a bit of a longer practice since, you know, the chapters on deepening practice. So that seemed appropriate. So I'll, I'll get to it here so we can have some, some text to be with together. So I'm gonna reread that one passage I just have been loving so much. Yeah, uh, this pra the practice involves both turning inward and openness to others. Oh yeah, it's probably how close it is to the speaker, maybe. Is that, no? Anyway, 
Sorry, friends, we are, we're trying to get the audio right. On uh, deepening practice, deepening spirit. Um, that's why I gave us a long practice. Deepening spiritual practice. So the practice here involves both turning inward and openness to others. So we, we did that, right? Just a little bit of the, and it's so interesting because again, I, I often, as many of the uh, folks who tend to care for others in the room, like we tell ourselves, care for yourself first, then others, even though we generally don't do it that way, we of course care for others first. And I just really love this, again, this non-hierarchical both, not one, not the other, but both. And I think for a compassion practice, you can interchange those easily, and that can be of great benefit. It begins with an introspection that makes one aware of the positive and negative aspects of the mind and allows one to encourage the former and correct the latter. So in the very beginning of practice, you know, doing that handshake with whatever is hard, it's, it's really, it's so interesting. Um, it's these qualities which we'll hear in this chapter of what's important, this introspection, being able to know our own mind, to create space, to cultivate kindness. They really are just so entwined together. And so this idea of, you know, that kindness towards ourselves, it's like a platform for then being able to sustain that attention, whether it's closed or open. And then having that opportunity to explore our attention and awareness in an expanded state, in a narrow state, and coming back to the heart. I, I think it's, it's interesting to work with this cultivation, both of our attention and awareness and our heart together. Then while continuing to purify one's own mind, one broadens the scope of one's attention, developing heartfelt concern for all beings who suffer under the influence of those negative aspects of the mind. Regular practice is also necessary to be able to progressively assimilate the profound teachings of an authentic master. It's essentially a process of inner growth and freeing oneself from the ingrained habits that keep, in, that keep one in the circle of suffering. So I love this idea again of just the inner growth and the freedom. I think what that says to me, which I can never hear enough, especially coming from the Vajrayana tradition, which is it's not that you need to create something new to be good. You are already completely fundamentally good and yeah, you could use some work but it's like a fixer-upper it's not a tear down you know and i i think it's so essential to keep that in mind um that this process isn't like i need to meditate so i can be better it's just the revealing just the gentle revealing of what's good the kind of cleaning um there the duration of meditation sessions of a practitioner's day may vary from a few minutes to many hours or even day and night in the case of a retreat. Then comes a time after many years where the division between meditation and post meditation dissolves and the mind finally free no longer makes a distinction between practice and everyday life. So wonderful. Really, I, I imagine some of us have felt that where really our everyday life can feel like practice. I got to walk here uh, with a newer friend and colleague and, you know, really felt just the vivid beauty of the city under these cloudy skies. You know, like every single leaf was like brighter and, um, you know, the sense of uh, connection. And it truly felt like practice on my way here to practice. And it's, it's so sweet when we can loosen a little our associations of what practice is. And that doesn't mean stop meditating for the record. I think all of us need to meditate as much as we possibly can. Let's just be honest, <laughs> right? There might be some folks for whom that may not be needed at all times. And there are some points in our life when meditation actually could be a disservice. 
But generally speaking, we want to be kind of cultivating those pathways, but also not treating life off the cushion as so separate and so different. I'd be curious for folks if anyone has an example of when they've noticed that practice has come alive off the cushion for them. Pop quiz. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, oh wait, can we bring him the mic? It's too messed up, no problem. That's cool. <laughs> hey, you guys. Um, if my practice is strong, it gets carried out into my driving. <laughs> if I'm doing, if you know, if I'm okay, if. We lost audio. She, oh, she lost. No. <laughs> Yeah. How's that? Better? Good. Yeah. Can you hear me? You. So, yeah. And then when I'm driving, I'll be aware of my bottom in my seat, my feet on the pedals, my hands on the steering wheel, and being patient and kind and generous at four way stops. You know, and it's and, and yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, it sometimes works. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a perfect example, right? It's so simple and yet makes such a big difference and something you can track actually and notice. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to repeat for Mace. Um, uh, I just love the joke. Mm. And I switch it up sometimes, so I'll, you know, like sometimes it feels like me, that person wants to feel safe. But I also sometimes feel like just like me, that person is feeling permanent. Yeah. Like yeah. Or that person is saying, if you can take a walk, or that person is saying, hmm. And you kind of try to like mix the way they walk. Yeah, beautiful. So Mace describes that when she walks down the street, she does the just like me practice quite a lot. So imagining whoever she sees just like me, this person wants to be safe or just like me, this person is impermanent. Um, I think uh, Howie Cohen calls that like a stealth meta almost. Yeah, which is sweet. Yeah, when I take Bart, I do that a lot. Uh, I think I've mentioned that before. Yeah. Anyone else? off the cushion, noticing how your practice comes alive. Lots of tonglen. Audio. Last audio's out. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. So I was saying that it happens to me when I'm cycling a lot that I get really focused and zeroed in and can feel like my whole body and I'm really in touch with the road and I feel like, you know, I'm just like so focused and it's just a really nice practice. And uh, yeah, that's all I thought. 
Yes, I'm super kind to others. Yes, <laughs> when, I'm, <laughs> when I'm in that place, yes, I'm very smiling and I love everything around me and everyone I pass and I just have this real sense of freedom. So it's a really nice place to be in. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, I point out the kindness, um, not only because I know you're kind, but I think sometimes we associate um, high focus with meditation. And though that is one aspect of meditation, if we just seek experiences where we're completely absorbed in a task, we may not be getting the benefits that meditation is really seeking to offer us, right? We might not have meta awareness. We might not be aware of our thoughts and emotions. We're just so kind of purely focused on one thing that everything else disappears, but not an ability to notice what's happening as it notices. So just good for us to get clear on that. All right. <clears throat> he says, <laughs> the instructions that follow are designed to help practitioners to develop and deepen their practice while avoiding the obstacles that will inevitably hamper its development and establish a continuity and balance in the spiritual training until it permeates every moment of one's existence. I'd really like that. These instructions given by the sages of the past or present are a direct expression of their own experience. They offer them as if, as the traditional expression has it, they had opened up their chests to show us the redness of their heart without hiding anything. Isn't that beautiful? They're just like opening up their hearts. When we meditate on them, we have to connect them to our own inner experience because only then can they take on their full meaning so that their truth, depth, and beauty can become a constant source of inspiration. I was thinking about this. I know there are a number of current and former educators in the room. How we learn. Uh, there was an interesting question in some curriculum. I'm supporting, we're building this curriculum right now, and we're talking about instructional hours and experiential hours. And for meditation, I was like, I don't know if I know the difference, right? If, if, if we're really thinking about instruction in meditation, it should really have an experiential quality. There are ideas, there are concepts, we're looking through this, but just as he says here, when we meditate on them, these teachings, we have to connect them to our inner experience because only then can they take on their full meaning. So their truth, depth, and beauty can become a constant source of inspiration. So the first uh, stanza here is, Teachings to which one does not apply oneself become as meaningless as an echo. So integrate them in your mind. That's my advice from the heart. So I'd be curious, since the whole instruction here is really applying oneself, how, how do you find a way to apply the practices to your life? It's a little bit like what we were just talking about of noticing that continuity, but how do you find an ability to really notice impermanence, to feel compassion? Practice, says Jimmy. How about our friends online? Yeah, no. And then our friends online. I don't see them. Um, something I've been working a lot with off and on, and it came up again recently, is when I have a very difficult emotion, when something happens that is not easy to deal with, turning toward it. And like, it's it's very literal. It's like, I wanna like get up and go for a walk, and I'll be walking, I'll be like, just go home and just notice, you know, and I'll just be like, I'll just keep walking, you know, and it's just this very, but I'm aware of it at least, and I'm, getting a little better at it, um, at not sort of distracting myself from the thing, which is what we work with a lot in meditation, but when it actually happens in real life. Yeah. yeah wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's pretty much the whole practice. So <laughs> good job. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I see Nick's hand, I think. Yeah. You know, for me, uh, it's like 
uh, you know, start with a short period in the morning of quiet time and meditation. And it's kind of like um, compassion phrases are also um, setting an intention, you know, and uh, keep my eyes open, <laughs> you know, and may this heart be at ease with the changing conditions of life. And man, mm. I want to avoid suffering. <laughs> you know, I want that's to right. Avoid and I, and I want to be mindful of the fact of what um, creating all the problems for me is, um, w- you know, like what the teachings say, wanting and not wanting. Yeah. You know, I don't want some things, but I want other things, you know, and can I be okay with things as they are? And can I, you know, and I live in the city, you got to keep your eyes open. If you sleep and something can happen, you know, so I keep my eyes open and, uh, it's hard, you know, to open my heart. Hmm. It, it is kind of hard to open my heart sometimes. And I noticed, um, you know, sometimes you'll see people on the street, you know, and I, I don't want to, I want to try to say this without sounding like it's virtue signaling, but there was a lady passed out on the street and I get, oh man. And so I called the, you know, the 311 and say, well, this lady's not, looks like she's not doing too good. And, and I, you know, sometimes it, I just happen to do it because sometimes I see God, men land and I just walk right by them. You know, I'm kind of used to it, you know, and it's that's kind of disheartening to me in a way yeah. if, I, if I really pay attention, you know. Um, so I think just trying to be open and, but the, 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 the quiet time in the morning is a must. You know, yeah. I have to set that intention right in the morning and kind of start my day from there and I and I feel like I can do pretty good with it Mm -hmm. um yeah so it's mostly that you know in showing up to um to to know to group meditation and uh yeah all the teachings I'm trying to soak it in and just show up and turn the camera on and participate and Mm -hmm. um and let it sink in you know how much Mm -hmm. I'm really absorbing I don't know but it's you know I seem to be doing (laughs) okay (laughs) so thanks for Thanks for that. Oh yeah, and um, the you talked about uh, during the guided meditation, you were talking about um, you know the emotional residue, and I find that um, that's also kind of a good noting phrase. Just yeah. note emotional residue. You know, not get into mm. the context of the you know the story of what happened. Just like oh, you know, like hearing, um, you know, feeling yeah. and emotional residue you know that's a gee that's emotional residue that's all that is and let me get back to my breath so thanks for Mm. that thank you yeah thank you for that for many of the points i'll start with the last one i just you know it's hard for me to imagine any person sitting to meditate and not having emotional residue it could be pleasant like i actually arrived tonight i shouldn't sound so surprised but like in a very pleasant space so the emotional residue was one of oh wow like joyousness but to recognize that residue as part of our practice is it's so helpful and i like you're suggesting Nick, we could try it as part of our noting practice like we did the noting last week yeah and i do think applying that frame of compassion to our experience in the world what i've noticed for myself on longer retreat or time when i've had practice uh, is I still have maybe the unkind judging of others or judging of myself, but there's a much shorter gap between those thoughts and the compassion. And I wish in this lifetime that those thoughts won't come, but I'm not banking on it, but I can start even like shortening the time in which the compassion follows and that's success, right? That's great success for us. Um, Note, I said during long meditation retreat, Uh, sometimes during the day too, right? Uh, Day to day that can happen. The next little stanza, and then there's just one, like just one stanza here. I don't know if we'll get to the whole part of it tonight that goes on for three pages. It's the whole chapter. But the next one is, if you apply yourself continually to the practice, appearances will become your teacher. And you will die having realized the entire phenomenal world is supreme bliss. Supreme bliss. Uh, (laughs) Mace questions all of it. Uh, If you apply yourself continually to the practice, 
appearances will become your teacher and you will have die realizing the entire phenomenal world is supreme bliss. It's, I, I, find, I do find it like stirring and inspiring. It, it requires such an incredible level of equanimity. It's almost unfathomable to me. I mean, I do see that the, there is a phenomenal world, right? There is a whole world in which we are projecting and imposing our ideas and perceptions. And that is where most of my dissatisfaction comes or uh, very quick to be over elation. So if I could see the phenomenal world or appearances as my teacher instead of something I want and don't want, Supreme bliss does sound like a little bit of an oversell, not going to lie. But then again, like, what does what feels better than just being okay with things as they are and not fighting them? I mean, it is so sweet. I know I've mentioned this before, but I think it, it takes us we have to kind of like, work up our palate to be able to taste that. If we're continually like looking for the more high intensity, high saturation experiences of being angry at someone or being you know, so excited about something, we might miss that supreme bliss of being with things as they are. I mean, it is so sweet. So maybe not an oversell after all. I'd like, I'd like us to get through just these first three stanzas. I just, I think they are incredibly beautiful. The first is, now that you obtained this human life, this eminent support, free and well-favored, don't waste it by every means, extract its quintessence. So we did in our very beginning of our practice tonight, that preliminaries, just remembering how precious this human life is, remembering that things are always changing Everything we do has a cause or leads to another cause and consequence. And that if we continue to seek just samsaric enjoyment, we'll be unhappy. So this kind of preliminary part of just recognizing that you've obtained this human life, this eminent support, free and well favored, don't waste it. I know this is so incredibly obvious, but every single day we wake up, we expect that we're going to be awake when we go back to bed and you know, we don't know and it's you know um for me it is such a help i think as, as nick pointed out making that time to practice in the morning we have to actually have quite a lot of motivation for that and some of that motivation can come from just that that remembrance the next stanza, the next two here, I feel like you could probably spend a year working with. Mind is the root of all phenomena. If complacent and careless, you neglect to examine it, it becomes an expert liar. But when you examine it, it has no root or basis. The mind is the root of all phenomena. If complacent and careless, you neglect to examine it, it becomes an expert liar. Anyone have a thought on what that might mean? If we aren't examining the mind, what might it be feeding or what might it lead to? Uh, it's got to be delusion. Yeah, <laughs> delusion. And there's so many versions, right? There's so many ways. And, you know, I think one that comes up kind of quite a lot um, is, you know, having, having a good example of, of delusion. So for example, we might think we received a, uh, an email that made us feel totally disrespected, unseen or hurt. Maybe it was from a friend, maybe from a colleague, and we spend a good part of the day and maybe even wake up at night thinking about it, like, what the fuck, right? Just so hurt, upset, betrayed. We find out the next week, it was not about us at all. 
right? Either, you know, we misread it or it was out of context, like complete and like, <gasps> it's gone. Like it was never there. Like all of that, poof. such a great way for us to just really reflect on our mind is an expert liar. And a lot of the stuff that we get stuck on is just that. It's just stuff that we've kind of created and attached to. Not that nothing isn't important, not that nothing doesn't matter or things are not painful, but recognizing our part in it. Often, even on pain, you know, we pile on the extra aspect of suffering. So when we're taught these Four Noble Truths, it's not that no one will die or be hurt or become sick again. It's that we won't add so much extra baggage onto that experience. The next stanza is, all phenomena of samsara and nirvana are nothing but the play of pure and impure. In the fundamental nature, primordially pure and empty, neither samsara nor nirvana have the slightest existence. Mm -hmm. All phenomena of samsara and nirvana are nothing but the play of pure and impure. In the fundamental nature, primordially pure and empty, neither samsara nor nirvana have the slightest existence. So curious what Pamela thinks about this. It feels it's interesting because it, it is it's suggesting that even our seeking of nirvana is still a like maybe obviously, but still kind of a dualist way of seeing and experiencing that there is something there's a there is the fundamental nature primordially pure and empty. And I was thinking about that a lot reading this, this, this passage. It's quite a leap of faith. I remember when I first, I remember when they first heard the word, word primordially pure and you're like, wait, what does that mean? or maybe we're still there, partially, like primordially pure. It, it, ha it doesn't, at least for me, resonate that easily. So I'm curious for folks, like how do you make sense of that idea? Something that is primordially pure, our fundamental nature, sometimes called unborn nature. Dharmakaya. Anyone have, I know that's a, that's a really tough pop quiz question, <laughs> but right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It is interesting. You in Tibetan Buddhist literature, you hear it a lot that primordial pureness. I mean, it's, it's, it's essential, right? But it's a tough, I think the word, oh, I see someone, something, yes, maybe. Please, Lindsay, what's primordially pure? Oh God, well, <laughs> it, it makes me think about um, Pure Land Buddhism, which I know very little about, but just um, sometimes I, I try to think about, um, you know, thinking of where we are now, we are, already in a pure land and yeah um what it makes it's it's helpful for me to think that because i notice that um you know walking around san francisco seeing a lot of suffering mm. um encountering lots of aggression and then me mm. feeling aggressive toward other people um if i can shift my thinking and think that of course at first it feels like that's absurd i mean that's an absurd rationally it's an absurd thing to think but um for me it it's like okay what if i it's a kind of deep acceptance of how things are and you know just the things that other people were saying earlier about driving or cycling and opening up to see people not as your enemy or antagonizing you but mm. just how it is so when i think about like primordial pureness it's like mm it's it's it, it exists right now in the here and now it's not something that we have to go back to 
um it's not like make true nature great again it's like <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh it's already here even if in the midst of like all the suffering and dirt and despair but that's mm. very hard to kind of actually like integrate into my thinking rational mind mm. so beautiful i love how you describe the challenge of it and and i'm curious when you when that like wisdom arises do you feel it like is there a sense when it even if it doesn't if you're like this is kind of absurd and yet like let's try this on or let's extend this possibility like how does that feel yeah i mean it does it it i feel like it's like fresh air entering my body mm -hmm. and i think about um it's like an immediate hit of gratitude as well for the privileges and benefits that I do have and um, just being like physically safe in my body in that moment. Um, even if it's for just a few seconds, it feels, it feels like breath actually. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And such a great example of applying the teaching experientially, right? Like how do we, try to bring these ideas especially something as difficult as um you know our fundamental nature primordially pure and empty it's it's so you know it's so interesting because essentially you're 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 describing the next stanza which is emptiness is not a mere nothingness it manifests spontaneously as radiant wisdom and from it, awareness and compassion shine forth. So when we're able to connect to that sense, that primordially pure, or that sense of um, something essential, we recognize that this emptiness, this ongoing change isn't nothing. There's a wisdom to it, right? And that from, from there, compassion is natural. So compassion isn't a fabricated experience. It just is naturally there, part of our true nature. I think it is, it's very complicated to try to, to conjure, to be like, okay, wait, what step comes first? All right, I'm primarily pure. Then I'm like empty. Okay, now I'm gonna just pull back a little into my understanding of wisdom about this and I'll have compassion. It really is, you know, Kind of like Nick said, like, keep listening to the teachings, keep trying them out. I think some of them are, are sticking. And it, it's true. Like, we think about this logic over and over, like, none of this stuff is ever new. Over and over and over, right? To have a sense of it. And some of these stanzas and the way they're written are inspiring. And some of them might just feel like opaque and obtuse. That's okay. They're just a starting point for us to discuss. Other thoughts on that or other reflections on maybe already living in the pure land? Pamela says she likes to remember that it's just a mystery. Yeah. So building on that mystery, I think, is also the understanding. Well, it, it's not cognitive. So that checklist that you just ran through, it will never get there from the checklist. It's got to come from the practice. And then it just arises naturally. So I think that it, it is mysterious in that way to this. But then the felt experience, the feeling and the practice, I think, is where it comes. Oh, yeah, that was that was that was me adjusting my mask. But since you since you asked for me to say something, I was thinking um just like I'm really uh i've really benefited from just uh 
some understanding that words are inherently reductive, like um, a lot of things can't really be described with language and or it's not always worth it to try to like explain verbally what's going on or capture the essence or something, um, even if it, you know, in theory could be possible. Like an, at the end of a retreat, um, I was thinking back like my first retreat at Spirit Rock, it was like six days long. And um, one of the people shared at the end, um, <laughs> the story was something like, um, I was walking down the path and I saw that there was, that, that there was like, I could either go deeper into the woods or I could turn around and come back. And I turned around and came back. And that's maybe a pretty average story, but, and then everyone cracked up because like a lot of this stuff you, you, um, you can't describe. It also reminds me of a story I heard about um, uh, Melanie Klein, an early psychoanalyst, where people were, her, her contemporaries were critiquing her theory or whatnot. And um, they said, you know, how could kids be imagining explosions? They've never seen an explosion before. And her answer, as I understand it, was essentially, well, first of all, language is inherently reductive, and these are pre-verbal kids. Um, and, and like, you know, to the extent that she was uh, working with kids who could talk, it was like, I'm trying to describe in their language what the kid would say if they could talk, right? So, um, so basically, it, it, it really disarmed all the critiques. I just loved that. <laughs> The profound insufficiency of language. Yeah, no, truly. And, it, you know, I know, again, sometimes these phrases can feel obtuse, but I think in some ways, the less literal and the more poetic, it will send us in a better direction than if it was just trying to literally say what to do. So I'm just going to read the ones we've read so far. <laughs> And I'll read just one more. I'll, I'll in, indulge myself. This, this passage is just so beautiful. Mind is the root of all phenomena. If complacent and careless, you neglect to examine it, it becomes an expert liar. But when you examine it, it has no root or basis. All phenomena of samsara and nirvana are nothing but the play of pure and impure. In the fundamental nature, primordially pure and empty, neither samsara nor nirvana have the slightest existence. Emptiness is not a mere nothingness. It manifests spontaneously as radiant wisdom, and from it, awareness and compassion shine forth. Awareness has no name, no characteristics. From its creativity, the multiplicity of samsara and nirvana arises. Yet what arises and what makes it arise are not two. Simply rest in this non-duality. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know many of you have bought this book. I just personally love it because almost any page you read, you could meditate on one page or one passage of it for a week or, um, or longer. This last stanza, the awareness has no name and no characteristics. From its creativity, the multiplicity of samsara and nirvana arises. Yet what arises and makes it arise are not two. Simply rest in this non-duality. It's so beautiful. And again, you know, experientially, we explore it in meditation to have that sense of our expansive open awareness, its creativity, all that manifests within it, and yet are of it. It's so powerful to touch that possibility of non duality in our own mind. It can really be the instruction without having to explain of how we want to be with ourselves in the world and with others, with appearances. Um, so, yeah, we will get back to the rest of this. I mean, literally, that's just four paragraphs, but geez. 
This, um, no, this is Kensi Choki Lodro. Let me look him up. H I J K. Kensi, da 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 da. 1981 to 1985. Oh, wow. Mm hmm. Yeah. True. Hard to know. But I, that name's familiar to me. Well, we can ask Chandra, but yeah, that's when. Well, it looks like that's when the teachings were. Kensi Choki Lodro. Yeah. So let's give ourselves just a moment here. Come back into practice. Dedicate our merit. So yeah, let's give ourselves a moment and, and notice anything that might have been stirred by the wonderful conversation. This invitation to deepen our practice. And consider the possibility that something tonight through our energy and presence could possibly lead to radiating circles of goodness. Recognizing the interdependence of all things, we dedicate our time and our presence here together to the hope and aspiration that all beings be free. All beings know the true cause and conditions of happiness and well being. And that all beings know their sense of belonging and connection. Thank you, everyone. Great to be together. So next week, feeding your demons. Get your demons ready. And otherwise, yeah, we will see you soon. Mm -hmm. Don't forget Donna. And if you want to volunteer, need volunteers, join the wonderful volunteers. Thank you all. <laughs>